to another uh, episode of the Rotator Cuff Expert. I'm Dr. Daniel Orcutt. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Specifically, I do a lot of shoulder surgery, rotator cuff surgeries. And so this podcast and YouTube and uh, whatever else you want to call it is really about trying to better understand rotator cuff, the injuries, the surgery, the recovery. So today uh, I'm going to go to a question that I was asked about pulsed electromagnetic field in the recovery of rotator cuff repairs. Uh, I, honestly, I've used it a little bit in uh, other ways in orthopedics, but never in rotator cuff. So I went through the literature and looked at what it says, uh, what we may be able to benefit from, and I'm bringing that to you. Part of the problem um, is the data is okay. Uh, it's not great, so it's hard for us to differentiate it out. So uh, we'll kind of go through each little phase of it. First of all, let's talk about what is Pulse electromagnetic field. I was trying to figure out, well, how do I say this? I can't say pulse electromagnetic magnetic field 15 million times throughout this, re this video. So I don't really know what I'm gonna call it. Probably electromagnetic field or uh, something like pulse maybe. So when we talk about pulse, pulse means that there's something, there's some device that's gonna create an electromagnetic field around what you want to fix. And so there's different things that we have tried to use it to fix. Uh, and so there's some more studies, we'll talk specifically the studies in just a minute, about that in specifically in rotator cuff repair, but it's also been used in other ways. Um, the idea in rotator cuff repair is that it's hoped to improve the healing of bone to tendon or tendon to bone. And that's where rotator cuff does. The rotator cuff, right, is, the, is first a muscle and then a tendon and then attaches to the bone. And almost always, not always, but almost always, that attachment is where the tear is, the bone to tendon attachment. So the idea is that, one, there's a reason why it tears there, which is probably because the environment there is not very good. And that means that the environment is not very good when it tears, the environment probably is not very good when we repair. Um, there's lots of reasons. One, because it's it may be a watershed area, which means the blood vessels may not get there as, as good as other places in the body. We also do this over and over and over all day long, most of us do. And so that's actually a pinch of the rotator cuff in what's called a subacromial space. The acromion is a bone that comes up around from the shoulder. The space is the space between that acromion and your rotator cuff and the bone underneath. And so if you do this over and over and over again, you're gonna pinch that rotator cuff over and get repetitive trauma. So sometimes we have a traumatic event where someone falls going downstairs, gets their arm yanked behind them, and that creates a rotator cuff tear. But lots of times it's not a traumatic or not a single traumatic event. It may be a cumulative event, event of over and over and again having that trauma. And so that will cause an injury to the rotator cuff, a tear of the rotator cuff. And if that environment's not very good, then it may have a hard time healing. We know the number one challenge of rotator cuff repairs is rotator cuff healing. The number two thing is stiffness, which is not in the scope of this talk, uh, but so number one thing is we, we wanna do our best to get the rotator cuff to heal. And there's things that we can do as surgeons. One, we often do a subacromial decompression, which means you take a little bit of bone off in that space, make that space a little bigger. It makes the space a little bit bigger, but also it gets some bleeding bone, which gives more uh, growth factors and should help heal it. Also, when we prepare, the, the spot where the rotator cuff attaches, we call the greater tuberosity. Where we repair it, we try to prepare that space. So we may do a bunch of things. Uh, one, we may um, just kind of shave the bone a little bit to get some more bleeding bone there. Uh, there's a thing that uh, a famous orthopedic surgeon from SCOE in South, um, uh, Southern California, we call the crimson duvet, which means we poke little holes into the bone there and we let that get the, the bone marrow and the bleeding up, and we hope that that helps increase the, the, the ability of the rotator cuff to heal. Um, and, and so when we talk about that, there's other things that people also talk about, just I'll mention this for a moment, I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but we talk about PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, which means you take a little blood, we spin it down, there's a little part of that blood that we may inject in and over around the rotator cuff, Unfortunately, that does not seem, at least in the data that I've looked at, does not seem to help the rotator cuff repair, but we continue to try and try and try to increase the ability of the rotator cuff to heal. Uh, and so one of the ways that we want, that we're trying uh, is this pulsed electromagnetic field or pulse. 
and we have used it before. So we have some kind of longer term data in bone healing. So if you have a fracture that's not healed, broken bone, doesn't seem like it's healing, over time, we may use this pulsed field around it. And that pulse creates an environment that does something to the little cells there to help increase the healing potential. So in fractures, the idea is to increase how the, the, the body makes osteocytes. Osteocytes are little bone creating or bone forming cells. Uh, and in the tendon area of, of rotator cuff, we try to do the same thing to try and encourage those. And so when we look at, um, when we look at the rotator cuff, we specifically um, look at how, not necessarily how bone is encouraged to create because we don't necessarily want bone, although we want the bone interface with the rotator cuff to heal. Um, we want the tendons uh, to encourage them to heal. And so when we look at uh, some studies, so there's a study out of the Journal of Orthopedic Research from 2017, and they look at in vitro studies. So in vitro means out of the body. In vivo is in the body, in vitro is out of the body. So this is really basic science. It's in a test tube, it's a petri disc. So it, it, it does just give us information, but may doesn't may not exactly translate to meaningful uh, in the real world, okay? So I'm looking at the study, so give me one second. Um, so what happened was when they did a specific type of pulsed field around these um, Tendon sites, so tendon sites, myoblasts, these are little cells of muscle and tendon. They, they showed that the tendon sites gene expression for healing increased, and they also showed increased myoblastic differentiation. Differentiation, sorry, myoblasts are, are precursors to muscles and tendons. And so it, it showed that it does do, does do something to those little tendons in the petri disc, in the test tube. However, we're not exactly sure what that means in real life. So, but that's a really interesting study. Um, and then, so there's another study. So there's another study. This is actually in a rat model. It's a journal of uh, shoulder and elbow. And in the rat model, so that means poor little rats, we created small tears in rat. We, I didn't, but you know, the, the researchers did. We create little holes in the rotator cuff and then we repair them. And then we give them a uh, pulse or not and see what happens. And so in the study there, it showed an increased Collagen organization. Collagen is an important uh, fiber within the tendon, so increase or, uh, organization of that, and also increase stiffness at four weeks after this this test. So this is, gives us a little bit more in, in, encouraging because it's still not in the human model, but it's in a rat model, which you know you hope that there's the translation between the rat model to the human model. So anyway, that's another study. The last study in orthopedics, uh, the Journal of Orthopedics, back in 2015, um, they did another study of pulse in what happened, and they say that decreased inflammation, decreased swelling, ink, decreased pain, and decreased recovery time at month three, so three months after the surgery. So, you know, we have some encouraging data, certainly uh, more data than I actually knew about before I was asked this question. So it's interesting, even being, me doing this and being really involved in a rotator cuff for 15 years, there's still things that we don't know, and, and there's it's always good for me to learn and then hopefully me to translate that to you so we can make an edu educated decision about what to do uh, with this information. So to me, the answer is maybe. We are pretty confident that the pulse electromagnetic field is not going to hurt anybody. So that's good. And just so you know, when we use it, uh, it doesn't feel like anything. You can't feel it. You put it on, you turn it on for a certain amount of minutes per day, permanent times per day. Um, and that depends on the manufacturer uh, and, and, and the protocol we use. So we don't, you know, it doesn't hurt. It's not going to hurt you. Is it going to help you? It may help you. Um, and to me, as an orthopedic surgeon who does a lot of rotator cuffs, it's interesting. I have not yet committed that I'm going to use it, but it certainly makes me think about it. And so if you have a surgeon uh, who's going to uh, request that you use it, there is some reasonable data that says, yeah, may, maybe it will help. And so I think it's not crazy to think, um, is this going to be something that's good? It's not, uh, you know, it's not smoke and mirrors. It may help. And so I think it's interesting. Uh, I will see um, as time goes by, as I look at more literature and more literature, try to determine whether or not this is feasible for my patients. One, because there is an expense, right? Because your insurance company is not going to pay for it. Um, so there'll be expense. We have to figure out where to get it from. There are manufacturers or ways to get it on the web. 
through Amazon or whatever. Uh, and, and, you know, so there's ways to get it. And it's also what, what protocol do we use? So how long do we pulse it? What pulse um, strategy do we use to, to see if, if it helps? And, and those are kind of those are kind of thoughts for me as thinking about using it. How do I get that um, involved? And how do I figure that right out? And so the, there's some studies that will show us, uh, but those are really details that probably make a difference. So again, the answer is maybe it's probably safe if your orthopedic surgeon wants to use it. It's reasonable. I don't. We can't say you you should, but it, maybe. Uh, and all we know is rotator cuff tears are hard to heal. We do know that the number one problem with us in orthopedics and fixing rotator cuffs is getting to heal. So we will continue to work uh, on our techniques, the surgical techniques, how to get the stuff in the right spot, how to secure it right. But also there's an environment that we have to make and we need to work on that environment to make it as good and as hospitable as possible for the rotator cuff to heal. So thanks again for watching. If you have any questions, comments, please leave them below. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you again soon about another topic in rotator cuff. Thanks and have a good day.